everyone. My name is Katerina Victoria. Uh, I arrived yesterday from Fort Oregon, so I apologize if I'm still a little symptomatic with jet lag. Um, my project, I will be looking at various ways to map the, an endangered Andean deer called the Wigul. My background is in fisheries and wildlife science international studies with a poli sign major because I'm interested in some socioeconomic and political influences in conservation and ultimately a certification in the GIS which it stands for geographic information systems um, so what brought me to this particular topic was an internship that I had done in Concepcion in 2012 so quite some time and uh, that's when I had first learned about the wing wing and the conservation challenges surrounding this particular species. So that kind of inspired my international degree thesis, where I essentially wrote a review of all the studies I could find that had been done on these species, so population surveys, um, anecdotal evidence. I basically created a synopsis of the information that was available when it was written what the methodology was, um, so that I could analyze kind of where we were at and what was missing. And at the time, uh, visual or spatial information was really lacking. So that is has changed since 2012, I'm happy to say. Um, so I'll be working on getting on board there. Um, what, what I'll be talking about is introducing the Wimwul as a species, and then looking at where I'm going to be working, what my current idea of the methodology is, uh, who my affiliates are, and then ultimately, ultimately what my goals are. Perhaps, oh, other oh, Okay. So the Wimwul is pronounced <laughs> the way <laughs> I remember this is to say way, way more. So um, it takes some time getting used to. I the reason I have to put this up here is because when I was talking about it in the U.S., people had no idea what I was referring to. Uh, it's a deer that is endemic to Chile and Argentina. There, it's considered to be very endangered. The IUCN has it labeled as an endangered species. There are approximately 2,000 left. Um, it's considered to be a flagship species of Patagonia, which essentially just means it's iconic to the region. And it is, it inhabits, or historically inhabited, an incredibly diverse uh, region. So the latitudinal range is tremendous. And we're talking about um, the implications of that being it has a huge amount of variability in its diet and in terms of what it can really survive in terms of winter and summer conditions does change tremendously. Its natural predators are the puma and the copeo fox, which predate on some of the crias. Uh, Thongs, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, that's just a little bit about the wemul. It's uh, considered to be culturally significant because it's on Chile's um, emblem and on the coat of arms. So you put it there because I knew I'd forget. <laughs> and something that I had found when I was here in 2012 was the public was relatively unfamiliar with this particular species. You'd read news articles and they'd have a picture of a reindeer <laughs> and it would say when we're, and people really didn't know what it looked like, where it lived, um, how to identify different deer species. So the pudu is a little, really cute deer. Um, a lot of people recognize that. The wenwu is like, it's a deer. So um, this, this is something I'd like to work on tackling, just um, public awareness, really. Um, a little bit about its endangered species status. Its population has declined more than 99%. They're um, when I last checked, there were estimated to be about 2,000 left in the wild, around 500 in Argentina, and about 1,000 left in Chile. Its range has diminished considerably 
um, by 50 to 70 percent. Now that fine in itself is a big range, so it's really um, kind of unknown. And it is now separated into two major areas. You have a northern population, a um, very isolated group. That's near Chiang, um, so quite far up north. And the rest is found anywhere from the Los Lagos in, the, in Valdivia all the way down to close to Punta Arenas. Um, here are some of the main threats. The anthropogenic threats include um, ranching, so the introduction of cattle, uh, which not only do they create competition um, and fencing starts to generate barriers, but also cattle carry diseases. So that's been really affecting the deer population as well. Um, fragmentation and habitat just from development, so the creation of roads, cities, uh, population growth, ranching, logging, uh, that has really disrupted the habitat continuity as well as the kind of consistency of what's available. Poaching, I put a question mark there because it has been documented in the past, but it's really difficult to document. Um, and I don't know if that has changed over time, so perhaps with regulations or its protected status, perhaps poaching is now not really an issue. So that, I'm just kind of unsure. I just put it up there because it used to be a um, major disturbance. And it's been documented that dog attacks have also really negatively influenced the, the populations. Essentially, I was talking about this yesterday with Leaf, um, in some of these cities, dog populations have increased to the point where a lot of the stray animals form these wild packs and essentially become wild. Um, so that's uh, an issue. And then also, I put weak protection mechanisms, partially just looking at it from a regulatory legal standpoint, and then also just logistically. Uh, these places are very remote, documenting any sort of um, violation of a protection mechanism would be difficult by in itself. Um, so those are the major anthropogenic disturbances. And then naturally derived threats include natural predation, um, disease, and again, that's kind of linked to cattle and, and anthropogenic disturbance. And now, uh, with the shrinking population size, you're getting genetic bottlenecking. So uh, inbreeding would start to become a problem. And they're already seeing that in the, in the northern wolf population, because it's so small. Um, also now severe weather. So as uh, habitat disturbance forces deer to maybe less viable areas, any real um, major winter event or drought significantly impact them. And then also just climate change. It's basically affecting everything. And here are some images. Car collision is another one. Um, that's just a subset of people driving the creation of roads. Um, here's an image of a poaching incident. Uh, Lara had documented this as being a part of a dog attack. And then habitat loss. I took this picture while en route to the Santuario Buenos de Vivinto, which is near Chillán. And getting to the sanctuary, um, it was just hours and of uh, forested agriculture. So, uh, monoculture, pine plantation, thank you. Uh, pine is not endemic to this, that particular region. So, that causes, I mean, obviously, that causes a huge disturbance. So here are a couple of points that I'm hoping to address throughout my time here. One of which is going to be identify spectral signatures of a variety of um, important plant species to the Wengler specifically, and then using satellite imagery to classify where those are over a larger region. So essentially what that would entail would be going out into the field, identifying um, different habitat types or different plant species by stand, and then collecting a GPS point. And then after that, um, using ArcGIS most likely to essentially automate um, a classification using the 
the RGB value of that particular thing. So look at the image, I say I know this type of plant is here, this is what the color is, and then um, the computer essentially will find that same color in different parts, and then you can look at that and start creating habitat classifications without actually having to go and look at um, the entire reserve. Um, another thing I would really like to look at is mapping exists existing WinWin data. So um, I was talking to some people in Konaf and in the south of Punta Arenas, and they have historical uh, data that has not yet been mapped. So transforming that information into onto a GIS platform uh, for them or helping in any way that I can in this process would be um, a part of the project. And creating an index to help define suitability by analyzing a variety of different things and trying to just look, figuring out what those are. Um, so like a small example um, could be habitat availability, where are there potential corridors, um, is, are those areas protected, um, where are the threats and what's the proximity that we can identify. So I'll be using ArcGIS. Um, and potentially QGIS because that's an open source um, program. So what I'd like to do is, is work with locals and um, learn so that we can learn from each other and QGIS is just much more accessible. ARC is very expensive. I have a student license which is what makes this possible for me because otherwise it would be thousands of dollars to own that software. Um, I was going to use an iPhone as my GPS receiver but I was recently informed that Android has a more reliable uh, geospatial system. So I'll be using a tablet instead. And then also using Google Earth Pro and uh, USGS Earth Explorer has uh, archives of satellite imagery. So I'll be using Sentinel and Landsat um, from here. And then probably just from the internet, finding the shapefiles and regions and cities, roads. Um, so basically, to get a, a real-world idea of what's happening, you put together a variety of layers. In my case, it would be um, a digital elevation model to know elevation, um, putting on layers of habitat, the reserves. You just start layering it up and then looking for patterns or correlations. Um, here are a few of the variables that I have identified. Elevation, terrain, slope, like is it north-facing, south-facing slope, where are these uh, deer sometimes found? Um, if they have done scat surveys, kind of where was this? What was around it? Why was this here? What time of the year did, was this found? Um, so, and then finally, buffering out. So looking at distance from road cities, um, any sort of other threat. I really like to also look at um, the larger pieces of private land surrounding the reserves and seeing what condition those are in. And, and potentially kind of reaching out to those landowners and talking about uh, something similar to a conservation easement where it's on a voluntary basis, you provide them information with what they can do to make their land more suitable to native species um, and kind of provide them with resources to be able to do that if they wish to do so. I'll be, I'm not sure where I'm gonna be <laughs> because as you saw earlier, the women are found throughout a huge landscape. So my home base will be in Tebuco when I'm not out in the field uh, because I have a friend visiting there. So I'll be with her. Um, but so Biu Biu by the Chian population, that's one spot. Then uh, Los Lagos, my Sen, my Magallanes. Uh, really it's gonna be down to where is an opportunity for me to go out? Uh, is there, are there people that I can collaborate with how accessible will it be in terms of the season, because winter is coming. Um, so my field season will likely be uh, through April and then starting again in September. Uh, my affiliates include uh, CONAF, which is essentially, it's very similar to the Forest Service in the US. Um, Universidad de Chile, Cristobal, he came today, uh, we just met. Um, all of my affiliates I basically know via email. Um, Universidad Austral de Chile, there is a professor there that had offered to assist as well. Uh, and the non-governmental includes Wildlife Conservation Society, 
uh, Round River and the Cliff, which is a local Chilean NGO. Uh, so my ultimate goals are to create habitat suitability maps. And I'm still relatively new to GIS, so there is a huge learning curve, and the possibilities are tremendous. So really kind of improving my own capacity and um, sharing what I know with others and vice versa. And then also ultimately uh, creating an online web map, um, which would be interactive and allow people to look at the reserves in a little bit of a different way. Um, so looking at the habitat and kind of being able to create those spatial relationships uh, on their own um, and to be able to ask those questions. And I think that sums it up. Station there, and then we studied the population, and we found I don't know if you read the paper, found that the, that population after we're traveling for uh, hunting and uh, poaching and and uh, basically poach, poaching and, and domestic animals, um, cattle basically, we were able to recover that population, and once we remove with both with uh, hunters the, the the cattle. After that, we saw some um, some tumors in the hooves, which we are working with the um, with Davis in California to try to um, to identify the, the pathogen which is causing that. And because of the quality of the samples, that place is very remote. We have to take uh, we go to Puerto Natales, so from here is taking an airplane to Punta Arenas, then driving some like five, four hours to Puerto Natales, then taking a boat, which takes two days to drop you in Puerto Den, and then from there, Conaf takes you with a boat that takes another eight hours to drop you there. And then once we removed some 50 uh, cows that were there that people illegally put inside it, this, this park, uh, after that we saw these uh, tumors in, in the hoops, and we think that could be a, um, a bacteria, which is carried uh, by the cattle. And recently, that's when, you know, so we're, we're researching on that, that pretty much uh, think that the cattle would be responsible or, or a vector for that. And on, on, on the other hand, um, about two years, since two years ago, people started to find Wemu in near, in, in a sen, like tourists in the, in the summer season, with uh, Wemu's with tumors uh, in, the, in the face. And that was analyzed. We analyzed some of those samples, and we found that it was it's a Corinibacterium, which is a bacteria. And that is mainly uh, vectorized by sheep. And in the area are sheep. So we think that perhaps uh, you know, sheep and, and, and barbed wire, uh, they can leave these bacteria there. It's uh, some little bit resistant. So then when we get in touch with that, there's no mass immunity and affects population. Very, very much. So those are two examples. One is documented. We, we have uh, evidence, which is Corinarium. The other is Treponema. Uh, we're working on that. The samples are not very good, so we haven't been able to uh, to get it uh, isolated. But mm -hmm. other than that, that's what we know. And and the rest is uh, just seeing what the cattle, how important it is in Patagonia, and, and how little sometimes um, control is. So people just. You know, they have uh, some animals, they drop them or they leave them to, to, to feed on the, on the, on the mountain forest and they just collect them once a year near September, which is our National uh, Independence Day, so lots of asal or some barbecue and such. Uh, so they're pretty much wild. They're very smart as well to be, to be hunted. Well, one thing that cows are not very uh, smart, but in fact when they are 
get wild, they, they're able to hide themselves, watch you from the, from the slopes and such. Uh, so that's what we know. With that in mind, I think you'd, uh, in the time I've spent in those parts of the mountains, uh, the, the passes that are used mostly by herders to herd cattle between um, areas across mountain passes. 